committed to supporting one another in our search for spiritual meaning and community. In Unitarian Universalism, you can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, and your expansive hearts. Together, we create a force more powerful than one person or one belief system. As Unitarian Universalists, we don't have to check our personal background and beliefs at the door. We like to say that we don't have to think alike if you're new to UU, I encourage you to take note of our mission statement, which is printed on the front of the order of service. We also work together to promote the eight principles, which are printed in the order of service. <clears throat> it's our tradition to welcome first, second, third time visitors or those who haven't been here in a while. Would you please stand if you're comfortable and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Let's start on this side. Hi. Hi. I'm Sarah Scott, and I'm here because my friend Elizabeth was talking about how much this place meant to her. And uh, she and Jim Carroll are fellow poets. And oh. So um, I live just past Warren Wilson, and I'm grateful to be here. Oh. <laughs> Anyone else on this side? How about this side? Hello. Hi, I'm Peggy Bradley from Bonita Springs, Florida. And I come here uh, usually every summer at this time, and I so enjoy this church. I'm a member of the UU Church in Naples. Welcome. Anyone else on this side? Welcome to you all. If you're interested in learning more about us or you'd like to receive our newsletter uh, or find out how you could be more involved with this community, there's a white card in the back of the pews. Uh, if not, it's on the table <laughs> in the foyer just beyond its double doors. We encourage you to fill out a card and leave it at the front table so we can get in touch with you. Uh, we've only got one announcement that I know of today and that is uh, Carolyn says that there's a sign-up sheet on the snack table. I'm wondering if it's still on the snack table. If it's not on the snack table, it's going to be on the foyer table, right between the doors. Um, if you're interested in attending a tour of our church property, Rain Garden, and hear a presentation about the new Rain Garden design, um, sign up. If we have enough interest, then the tour of the program will be October 6th. 5 p.m. It's our practice to acknowledge with respect that the land we stand on today is the ancestral home of the Cherokee people and other indigenous peoples. The Cherokee, through their stewardship, understanding, and conservation, survive and thrive in this land. We acknowledge their enduring connection to their homeland. Now, please make sure that your cell phones are muted and 
So we're going to begin at service. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Another fine summer day. Our opening words today, I had about three or four picked, but I want to settle on this. This is uh, by Unitarian Universalist Kathleen Mateeg. She writes, into this home, we bring our hunger for awakening. We bring compassionate hearts and a will towards justice. Into this home, we bring the courage to move on after hard losses. Into this home, we bring our joy and gratitude for ordinary blessings. By our gathering, we bless this place, and in its shelter, we find ourselves blessed as well. So, having said that, please rise as you are willing and able, and join in singing the opening hymn this morning, number 207, Earth is Given as a Garden. sacrifice for it. There is nothing in all the world so important as to be loyal to this faith which has placed before us the loftiest ideals. Which has comforted us in sorrow, strengthened us for noble duty, and made the world beautiful. Do not demand immediate results, but rejoice that we are worthy to be entrusted with this great message that you are strong enough to work for a great true principle without counting the cost. And all the finding of ever new applications of these truths, 
and do join us in their contemplation, always trusting in the one God who is our greatest son of us. All right, now we have a treat.
And so it's time for joys and concerns. So Diane will light the candle for you. Please come up and share if you feel comfortable. The microphone is there and it's on. And the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Anna Marcel Vermoos. And I said to Bray, when I got a text this morning, I'm gonna cry. And then you guys made me cry before I started. <laughs> okay, but I'm going to start with one joy, and then I have a sorrow. Um, the joy I have been holding off on telling you, um, Ray and I are great-grandparents again. <laughs> to a little Lithuanian, Olivia Matilda. She was born on August 11th, and everybody's good. Uh, and I got a text on the way here uh, from Heidi about Marie that um, asking for everybody to uh, send safe passage to her mama because um, she's speaking in ways that make Heidi think it's kind of imminent. Uh, she's speaking German and speaking of people that are uh, past. So keep Marie in our hearts and. Sounds like she's peaceful and transitioning nicely anyway. And of course, sometimes this could be next week too, but I get me to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sue. Um, when I sang this song, for good, I have been changed for good. I came here 2009. To this you, you should. I was broken. I was down. I was despair. I lost all my hope. And you all, I know you all, you lit me up. Thank you. You have shamed me for good. Thank you. Morning. Larry Perlman, I have a, a, a joy and two sorrows. One of my joys is that I got to hear the choir today, because I never get to hear them, and uh, sorrow was I didn't get to sing with the choir today. Um, my other sorrow is a dear friend um, who is with our bridge group, a man named Roger Finna. I don't know if any of you know him, but he's been suffering for some time now with something called tenesmus. I had never heard of it, and uh, the doctors don't seem to be able to help him. He's in a lot of pain all the time. So we're hoping it clears itself somehow, but it's been going on for some time. So keep him in your, in your hearts. Hi, I'm Linda Metzner. And um, I got a call yesterday from a friend in one of our the devoted sopranos, Maggie Moon. And um, she wants to tell you all that she's doing better. She has some pain, but um, improving with all those broken bones that are mending. Um, and she wants to thank you all for a big box of cards that she has that are mostly from you all. She's appreciated it more now because she was in a fog after she got thrown from a horse. And um, she is, I saw that she has been riding a bicycle a little bit, and today she's going to lead a dance class. <laughs> so hi, I'm David Reed. Um, wanted to follow up on Anna's thing with babies, and um, I now said I'm a grandfather for the first time as of Wednesday, August 17th. Um, Nora Ann Nix uh, was born that evening to my daughter Katie and her husband Jeff, so candle of joy for that. And uh, another candle, you know, we uh, welcomed a new Afghan family into the community and the mother has been uh, pregnant and is reaching delivery time. So last night, um, my wife um, babysat her 16-month-old, and our own Tina Rosado went with the mother and stayed at the hospital 
only to find out that things were, uh, the baby went decided to wait a little while before, <laughs> before entering the world, and then everybody came home at 3 a.m. this morning. So uh, I expect that Jane is uh, getting some sleep even as I talk, but just a, a candle of, I guess, natal expectation for the, for the African family. So that comes quickly. Thank you. This is a candle of joy. I'm Barbara Rogers. First of all, thank you so much to our care committee. I had a small accident a week ago, and I've had so many people willing to drive me places I needed to go. And I just love the care committee. You are so great. Also, um, I'm looking for another car. So if you know anybody selling about a 10-year-old car, that's what I can afford. Well, let me know. <laughs> Morning. I'm Elizabeth and I bring you a report on Jackie Franklin who is in the second week of having her shoulder replaced and has moved from very heavy medication to Tylenol 2 but she's in that stage of recovery like this. I got an email that said well I just walked for an hour and <laughs> missed the thunderstorm when I got home so I'm panicking at not you know she's in that stage of recovery like she thinks she can do anything and then <laughs> boom, she's back at home. Um, so she hopes to be coming maybe uh, next week. I'll bring her and she can't drive for the next five weeks, but I'm her neighbor, so I can bring her. But she misses us, so she sends her greetings. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, you light a candle. Uh, Jessica's friend, uh, Rose, is still going through some health issues and Jessica requested that we light a candle for her. I would say it's sorrow, but it's definitely concern. And a candle of joy from all of us here. Um, you know, we appreciate everyone here for what you do and uh, keeps us afloat. Uh, specifically, I want to uh, say a, a heartfelt Thank you from all of us uh, to you, Mary Sorinova, for all you do, for the sign outside, for just being the, the wise soul that you are, for the artwork here, reminding us what we say we believe and trying to put that into practice. So would y'all show her some love? <laughs> It's the little thing. The uh, flowers from her garden. Yeah, yeah. Just, just such a giving spirit, and we appreciate it. And her smile. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who, for whatever reason, did not feel like sharing uh, a joy, a concern, a sorrow, know that we keep you in our hearts and in our minds. And so. With that said, I'd like to invite you to center yourselves in the, in the spirit of prayer meditation. And I want to share with you um, a reading called In Betweenness. And it's uh, by Richard Gilbert. I rely on his wisdom and eloquence uh, almost every Sunday. He always has something that needs to be shared. So. And after that, we'll have a time of quiet as usual. In between this, we live in between festivals of gratitude and joy, in between seasons of contrasting color, between floods of brightness and seas of whiteness. We live on a remote island outpost 
in fathomless space between stars and moons and planets and void, surrounded by meteors, comets, rays and nothingness in which there is no right or left or up or down, only between us. We live not at the apex of joy, nor in the nether of sorrow, but in the moving space between uncertain of our locations. We live walking from city of birth to death, hoping along the way to see something of beauty, to touch hands with those we love, to give more than we get, to make some sense of all of this. We reside in the in-between. So now, in between this and the offering and the sermon and all of those things, I leave you with the eloquence of silence. And so it is. The greatest use of life is to spend it on something that will outlast it. So says my favorite philosopher, William James. And so in the spirit, we'll collect this money.
Thank you. And sometimes I, I, I hear them, bits and pieces, I get triggered, uh, I get triggered anyway, but I get triggered when you're out there, or I'll read something, or something will happen to me, I just look for sermon uh, uh, information just to get the, the juices going. And I was on the internet and I ran across this topic by a retired minister, Reverend Tony uh, Larson, 42 years at the uh, church in Racine, Wisconsin. And so I just kind of uh, took it and, and riffed on it. So, um, but I want to, this is something that is called If I'm a Unitarian. I just found it in uh, a stack of papers the other day. So I'm gonna lead off with this. If I'm a Unitarian, then I have come to know that no one creed can say it all, and there's always room to grow. If I'm a universalist, then it's clear to me that they say tolerance, I, I hopefully will get to acceptance, but tolerance will only come when minds are opened and free. If I'm a Unitarian, then I have come to feel that there is worth in everything as long as it is real. If I'm a universalist, then I can understand that freedom and responsibility go hand in hand. If I'm a Unitarian, then gladly I rejoice that my beliefs and my way of life are all completely by my choice. If I'm a universalist, then I have come to learn of countless useful things to do that teach religious concern. If I'm a Unitarian, then I'm really free to let myself be just the person I was meant to be. And lastly, if I'm a universalist, then I believe it's true that you can learn as much from me as I can from you. So, Reverend Tony Larson had uh, written a sermon who said, who should not be a you, you? And I read it and I was intrigued and so I kind of added stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what intrigued me most about uh, what he says is that when I initially decided to become a Unitarian Universalist, coming from an American Baptist tradition, obviously there were many people who criticized, uh, you know, my choice. And there were, co there were comments about us being kind of like a salad bar religion, where you get to pick and choose what you want to believe in. And, uh, and, and, and what is it exactly that you believe in anyway? Some of my seminary professors, uh, we had this tug of war, um, open people, very white people, because it was always a question of authority. Where do you get to, the right to do this? And what they were saying is that I had to, there was a God I had to get the right from. And at that time, there was for me. Different now. But they, could, they couldn't get it that I get to choose that. I can, I, my authority comes from me. At that time, there were some UU congregations that actually closed during the summer months, not all of them in, in New England, which was a bevy of uh, UU Christian churches. They're very beautiful churches. I almost had an opportunity to, to serve a UU Christian church. I wound up serving one in Brooklyn. But many of the, 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 the UU churches went on vacation. They closed some of them during the summer months. And of course, you can imagine the comments about classism and elitism and, you know, it was mostly wealthy white congregations who would, who would close a religious institution during the summer? You know, these were the questions. And, uh, you know, there were frequent, uh, common, frequent comments about class and that kind of thing. And I listened, I really did. And there were some good points to be made. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I try not to let the perfect get in the way of the good. 
And so I decided to hang in there. And so here I am. This article by Reverend Larson was, was, was powerful for me. Um, he said that it's someone he had spoken to at his, um, at one time, described the UU Church as a place that welcomes Christians, Jews, agnostics, and even a German shepherd for <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, and And this is true. This is true. We, we haven't had one in a while, but we'd have the blessing of the animal service. Maybe we'll do it in the spring. Um, I think Hendersonville or Ashland, one of the churches is going to have one. They're going to have, they're going to bless the animals inside. I think we've done that here too once. But it's true. We, we do that. It's like St. Francis of Assisi. It's not new. But Larson acknowledged that the man was trying to be funny and that he laughed. But behind his remarks were, uh, was an unwarranted assumption, and I've heard you, you say this, that anybody can attend or join a UU congregation. And that's not true. That's simply not true. The assumption is that we have absolutely no discernment process at all. These are my words. And behind that assumption lies another even more troubling one, that we don't stand for anything that our minds are so open that our brains are, are falling out. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can believe anything you want and be in a in your church. Someone mentioned that the other day. Um, you know, I picked my battles. I, you know, I didn't feel like getting into it. But um, he goes on to say that everyone cannot become a Unitarian Universalist. And this is true. I was talking to my partner the other day. She has a friend who equates liberalism with good. That if you are liberal, I'm talking in a political context, if you are liberal, you are good, and if you're not liberal, you're not good. And, and you know, not every liberal person adheres to our eight principles. You know that, right? I mean, I hope you're not in that group. It's a little <laughs> more layered than that. Life is a little more complicated than that. Um, but, but that's where, where, where she's coming from. And, and, and so not everyone should be a Unitarian Universalist. Not everyone should be. I agree with him when he says that. He says that the first criterion for getting into our congregations and churches and societies and fellowships is this, that you really got to know how to sin. <laughs> this is crucial. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I know how to sin really, really well. And that's very important to us. And, and, and I'm saying it in jest because sin in the Greek means missing the mark. We all do that. It's, what's, it's, it's called being human. But it was important because not everyone knows exactly how to do it. Uh, we don't want people here who never do wicked things. We don't want people here who are holier than thee or holier than thou, who don't know how to forgive who kind of got this thing up there, you know what, it's about how things, I gotta control your life, and you gotta, you know, we don't want that here. We don't want that. I'm not saying we don't have it, but, but we don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want people who have made it in the salvation department or are just waiting around to get picked up. Because people, because people with, with too much heaven and them are hell to live with. Okay? Those are his words. I would put it this way. We don't want people who are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You know, where they kind of put you on a pedestal and as soon as you make a mistake or whatever. See, 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 you know, we don't need that. Life is tough enough as it is. Don't get me wrong. If there were any perfect human beings around, we might let them in. But since there aren't any, and anyone who claims that he or she doesn't do wicked things is either trying to fool others or they're trying to fool themselves. So it is the nature of a human being to make mistakes, to be evil as well as good. And you should not be in a UU church if you're not willing to admit that to yourself. Can we at least agree on that? Amen. Amen.
<laughs> Knowing your shadow side can be of great assistance in understanding and accepting the same thing in other people, right? If you haven't worked out things that you need to work out, then you're going to project that on other people. And you're going to be kind of stuck up and, you know, need tongues or whatever you need. And so you can't lead where you haven't been. People who have self-knowledge and are honest with themselves, folks who have worked on themselves a bit, whether it's therapy or whatever you do, when you meet or deal with the shortcomings of other people, you tend to have a little more compassion, I find. You tend to have, rather than be self-righteous, you tend to have a little more compassion with understanding instead of judgment. At least some of the time. They realize that they too are human and have flaws. Reverend Larson suggests that knowing how to sin should be a criteria of, of, of membership. <laughs> and I agree. He says that if you think you're too good, you won't like it here. <laughs> you do not like it here. But with a little bit of hypocrisy and selfishness and deceit, you'll do just fine. <laughs> now, we're not asking you to develop these qualities. You know, because we really don't need to. It's, it's what it means to be human. Each and every one of us has already has them. We're just asking of ourselves to recognize them in ourselves. And it'll do wonders for our acceptance and tolerance of other people's foibles. He goes on to say that the second criterion of reason for not being a UU has to do with our intolerance of intolerance. <laughs> you should not be a UU if you support the Nazis or the KKK or any other group that believes in oppressing people. But that's so obvious. But it's important. We may be open in our institutions, but we're not that open. We are closed to things like closure. That is, we are closed to movements or groups that close people off, that marginalize. And when we say our church has freedom of belief, we mean that, but in a limited way. He says that you are free, and you know this, to believe whatever you want here, but as long as it helps you to become a more caring and humane human being. I know that goes without saying, but you'd be surprised. It's easy to forget, and so we have to learn to remember to remember. It, 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 as long as it doesn't prevent you from living a caring life, because that's a, that's a limitation on freedom of belief. So when someone says, what do Unitarian universes believe? And you answer, oh, we believe whatever we want to, that's simply not true. <coughs> there are a lot of things we don't believe in. We don't believe in limiting people because of the melanin or lack thereof in their skin. We don't believe in restricting people on the basis of gender. We don't believe in excluding people who are just different, whether they're differently able or different in any other way. We don't believe in denying rights to those whose personal preference of lifestyle is different from the norm, so long as that lifestyle doesn't infringe on other people's beliefs. I'm not here to act the way you think I need to act. Yes, there's a way a minister needs to act, universally accepted. And you have the right, because you have to be you. That's very, very important. We don't believe in destroying the environment. We don't believe that injustice and poverty are just some unfortunate accidents that we don't have any responsibility to do something about. There's some very definite limitations on freedom of belief in, 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 in our churches, and, and those are some of them. Uh, uh, these are rather different from the limitations of belief in other churches. We accept that. 
Have you ever stopped to think about some of the creeds in Orthodox Christianity? I know uh, many of you do. I, I can recite the Apostles' Creed. I wrote it out, but I'm not going to read it. But you remember, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I'm not going to do it, but you got it. <laughs> it works for many people. Did you catch anything in it, though, about love or peace or, or kindness? You can argue that those things are implied in the Apostles' Creed. We took on the eighth principle, and one of my resistances to it, as I shared with you and I got on board, is that I thought the, the racial justice piece was implied in our seven principles, but it wasn't given any explicit emphasis, and neither are love and kindness in the Apostles' Creed. That's a creed made up on doctrines with the ethics only vaguely applied. If the Unitarian Universalists have a creed, if we have a creed, it's an ethical creed with the doctrines only vaguely implied, if at all. Some people say our eight principles are a creed. You can't please everybody. But if you read the principles, you'll see what I mean. They're words like justice, equity, compassion and human relations, acceptance of one another. Not when I act the way you want me to act, but acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. Affirming and promoting the inherent worth and dignity of every person and the goal of what? World community, liberty, and justice for all. You don't find the Holy Ghost you don't find uh, uh, Mary, the Virgin Mary, the only begotten of the Father, that is substance of the Father. I mean, people will get killed over this stuff, have been, but you don't find that. Doctrinal precepts like that, we don't care that much about one way or the other. If you believe them, as long as whatever you believe helps you live a humane life. An illustration. If, if believing in God or a God helps you be a better person and it doesn't make you a worse person, then I say you better believe it. Believe it. We encourage that belief. If being an atheist helps you take more responsibility for creating a better world, or it doesn't at least prevent you from making it worse, be an atheist. Be an atheist. Don't believe in God. We encourage your atheism. The only beliefs we don't want you to have are ones that lead you to hurt other people. And other than the obvious ones I already mentioned, I can't tell you what the bad beliefs are. Because sometimes the same beliefs do different things for different people. Right? I mean, they do. For example, a lot of folks believe that there's a heaven and a hell after you die. A lot of folks believe that. For some reason, that's positive for some people because they wouldn't be good otherwise. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. They need that. I'd rather have you trying to be good because you realize that's a better way to live, but that's not, I can't control that. So rather than because you're afraid of punishment or right or wrong or want to reward, you do good because good is good to do, not because you're, you're bribed by heaven or hell. But if you're not going to be good without believing in heaven and hell, then that's a good belief for you. That's a good belief. Larson tells the story uh, of the time one woman who came to him and said, Reverend, something has to be done about my husband. He said, he don't, he don't come home at night. He doesn't help the children. He's gallivanting all over town, gambling and drinking and running after women. I mean, it's a, it's a hot mess. And then the minister says, well, your husband is a miserable, you have, you have my deepest sympathy, your husband is a miserable sinner. And she said, Reverend, a sinner he is, but miserable he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's at the time of his life, obviously. <laughs> so, if you're sinning, and you're having 
the time of your life, Mr. Larson is not sinning. Some of this is, but by sinning, I mean if you're doing things to hurt people, then maybe it would be better if you believed in future punishment for evil. If you're not going to be good about believing, without believing that, it's a positive belief. If you believe in an afterlife, and that works, if that makes you better, and it doesn't make you any worse, that's a mutual belief. If you believe there's life after life. But for some people, believing in heaven and hell is negative because then they start deciding who's going to go to heaven and to hell. And it's always under God's guidance, of course. And they end up condemning people and passing discriminatory laws against people in general and making the world less a, a, a less tolerant place. So for some people, believing in an afterlife is negative, and for some people, not believing in an afterlife is very positive because earthly life is more sacred to them. Wars and killing are greater evils to them because, you know, there's more, it's more final. If you don't have a soul, then you, you, you know, this is really precious because you don't believe you're going anywhere after this. It just gets dark. Human life is precious. Eliminating poverty and hunger on the earth becomes a more important task than believing in streets paved with gold and, and that kind of stuff. So not believing in an afterlife makes some people more humane. I don't care which one you have as long as you're humane. But my point is there's a limitation on what you can believe. That's what, through all the humor and stuff. That's what I want to, that's what I think he's getting at. He doesn't say that, but that's what I think he's getting at. So you may be interested to know, by the way, that the universalist side of our tradition um, used to belong to the National Council of Churches. Did you know that? Uh, uh, they were kicked out, though. <laughs> they were kicked out for not believing enough. And, you know, and, and, no, Orthodox Christian Church said, if you let the universalists in, we will not join. Right. So, we wash it out. You see, every denomination that now belongs to the National Council, Council of Churches has to believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior, so we don't fit in. But there's some universalist Christians. It's always layered. It's always more than we think. There are some universalist uh, Christians and churches who believe that. But that one little thing, it, it doesn't sound like a lot to ask, but it is. It is a lot to ask. Uh, you know, Love, human rights, humanity, peace, equality, it's a little bit more than just believing in, in, in a Christ figure or, or Christ. We want more from you than that. We want more from you than that. At least I do. You should not, he says, you should not be a you, you if that's all you believe. If that's all you believe, that Jesus is Lord and Savior and you don't do anything to walk it out here, then we, you really don't need to be here. Here's one for you. Now, and, I, and I took advantage of this one. <laughs> you shouldn't be a union, you, you, if you expect the minister to do always have the same views as you do. That's the third criteria he writes about. See, I might not be as liberal as some of you would like, or as conservative. I might be too spiritual. I might not be spiritual enough. I'm not an advocate. But you got to live with that <laughs> until you get rid of it. <laughs> you know, it's really the way it goes. And so um, I may dress differently. Somebody said something. I had sneakers on the other day. One time I had a T-shirt. I mean, underneath the suit. I mean, really? <laughs> really? Reverend Larson also talks about a rating system for UU ministers. He says he read a, he, he read a sermon rating um, somewhat that sort of, he would like one that coincides with movie ratings. <laughs> <laughs> a G rating means the sermon is generally acceptable to everyone, full of inoffensive platitudes, usually described as wonderful. <laughs> PG is for more uh, mature congregations. At times, this sermon is relevant to today's issues. It may contain even mild suggestions to get you to change, often described as challenging or thought-provoking. I added a word, offensive. 
<laughs> Even though no one intends to take any action or change any attitudes, are rated definitely restricted for those not easily upset, threatening to the comfortable, most often described as disturbing, and finally X-rated sermons, <laughs> positively limited to those who can handle explosive ideas. This sermon is always described as shocking or in poor taste, like my books on UFOs and religion. <laughs> the minister who preaches this sermon had better have an outside source of income before <laughs> with a public committee of a church looking for a minister. <laughs> or a spaceship to get on. <laughs> Just to get on, yeah. I, I love this, though, when he says that you should not be a UU if you don't like getting offended. If you haven't been offended yet, it's only because you haven't been around long enough. <laughs> and I'm, uh, uh, he says that on some issues, talking about some issues uh, in our lives today, the minister's bound to hit some raw nerves, and you gotta be ready for it. At least you know it's not personal, right? You know I, I care about you, uh, and the fact that we disagree at times will never take that away. I mean, not unless you're just disrespectful or disrespectful to each other. Um, but that's always there. You shouldn't be a UU if you don't think Christians should be in the church or atheists. You should not be a UU if you think an atheist, if you're an atheist who thinks Christians don't belong here, or psychics, or pagans, or spiritualists. The, the, the criterion is humane living. The rest is a matter of individual choice. You should not be a UU if you all, all if you want all the answers because we don't even have all the questions. <laughs> and finally, you should not be a UU if you can't stand name calling. You are likely to get it by staying here. When you tell people you're UU, some of them will seize on the more sensational aspects. Oh, you go to that gay church, or you go to that uh, atheist church, or. You're the people who worship flowers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Labeling is a price that you pay and you risk when you belong to this church. Some people who used to be members here decided not to take that risk, and that's okay. And then there are others who decide that those who label and name call reveal more about themselves than they do about the church. But there's bravery if you've decided to stay here. There's courage. And there's courage in not running when you're under fire. And so if there's any consolation, Unitarians and Universalists, we have a long history of being vilified and labeled and of responding with courage uh, to those challenges. And so, you know, having a woman minister in the first of the United States, Olympia Brown. We haven't been perfect around issues of race, but at least we try to deal with them. It's painful, it's hard. We're a mostly white denomination, but we are dealing with that. And that's what it takes. You don't wanna let the perfect get in the way of the good. You should not be a UU, you know, here in universities if you don't like diversity, not just racial diversity, plurality of thought, people, you know, age, what have you. This is not the place for you. If you're, if you're wrestling, okay. But if it's an issue that people aren't behaving the way you think they should, um, or you disagree, you know, there's a whole slew of them up and down the block. <laughs> if you can't stand the name calling, that will inevitably result from being in a diverse church. And finally, Reverend Larson says he offers his heartfelt thanks to all of you who have stuck it out. <laughs> and I offer the same heartfelt thanks to you as well. The beach? <laughs> <laughs> I just watched all three of the Godfathers. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Take the gun and leave the canoe. <laughs> oh, Clemenza. Anyway, let's go. Okay, uh, yeah, number 34.
Though I speak with bravest fire, please rise if you are willing and able. And thank you for sticking. <laughs>